um, we're going to be talking about Magicians of the Gods, the forgotten wisdom of Earth's lost civilization, and this is the sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods. Uh, Graham Hancock's multi-million bestseller, Fingerprints of the Gods, remains an astonishing, deeply controversial, wide-ranging investigation of the mysteries of our past and the evidence for the Earth's lost civilization. It's 20 years on now, and Hancock returns with the sequel to a seminal work filled with completely new scientific and archaeological evidence that has only recently come to light. That's the nature of what we're going to get into today. Graham is with me on the call. Uh, I'm going to bring Graham straight in. Uh, you can follow along with today's author, GrahamHancock.com. And of course, uh, Magicians of the Gods is the latest book. Graham, great to see you, brother. Great to see you again. Um, James. What a book, Graham. What a book. Um, I guess before we get into the nitty gritty and the details, uh, I've only got you for an hour. What? You know, 20 years is a long time to pass, Graham. At what point did you feel, I'm guessing there was a need and a duty to do this book? It wasn't just you wanted to write a sequel. Well, no, it's, actually, to be honest, I, I, I didn't want to write a sequel. No. Um, I uh, was very focused on the issue of a lost civilization uh, from the early 1990s through until 2002. So... 10 or 12 years, it was mm -hmm. absolutely the centerpiece of my life. And I wrote a series of books on that theme. The, 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 fir the first of them, Fingerprints of the Gods, which addresses the issue of a forgotten episode in, in human history head on. And then with uh, Robert Boval, uh, Keeper of Genesis, which was called Message of the Sphinx in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Heaven's Mirror. Uh, photographed by my wife, Santa Faya. That's a, a photographic book as well as a substantial text. Um, and then uh, on this theme, Underworld, a huge book that I published mm -hmm. in 2002, the result of um, nearly seven years of scuba diving all around the world looking for uh, structures under underwater, so, w which were covered by rising sea levels at the end of the last ice age. So really I felt after Underworld that I'd done the... I'd done the job, you know, I'd done, I'd done my bit. I had put before the public a massive body of work, which raises the possibility, I insist on nothing, but I raise the possibility that we have lost a whole episode of the human story, an episode of advanced civilization in remote prehistory during what we think of as the last ice age. Now, for putting out these series of books, it was particularly so with Fingerprints of the Gods, but it was true with all the other books as well. I was subjected to a massive amount of, uh, of attacks. Uh, and psychically, it is not pleasant uh, <laughs> to be continuously attacked and to be accused of all sorts of things by people who haven't even read my book, you know. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is the thing. I mean, um, the, there's, there seems to be a, a narrative about me and my work out there which a lot of the mainstream media just buy into without actually talking to me or reading my book. And it's the same with academics. They have a notion of what I am, but most of them have never read my book. They, they, you know, they bandy around words like pseudoscientist or pseudo-archaeologist, ignoring the fact that I never claim to be an archaeologist. I'm a journalist. I'm a reporter. That's mm. all I am. Mm. Uh, I never claim to be a scientist. So I don't see how I can be a false scientist or a false archaeologist, which is what pseudo means, since I don't wish to pass myself off as either of those things. Uh, but this, you know, this narrative is out there. So deeply unpleasant um, and putting me in a place where I'm in constant struggle. That's why Underworld is such a big book, more than 2,000 footnotes, because I'm writing defensively. I'm bulletproofing every, every argument against the often in, insidious and dishonest, disingenuous nature of the attacks that has, have been mounted on my work. So after Underworld, I thought, phew, OK, I've done my bit. I've walked the walk, seven years of scuba diving, climbed the Great Pyramid five times. You know, I've been I've been there. I've done that. I've been insulted. I've been I've been attacked. The BBC devote, you know, more than half a million dollars to making a program deliberately designed to destroy my reputation. Oh, yeah. I've been out there. I've done my work. I've had enough. I'm out of here. And so my next book was about. Um, a completely different subject that was supernatural was published in 2005 about shamanism and altered states of consciousness and the role of psychedelics um, in the emergence of the modern human mind completely different subject then i wrote some novels i wrote a novel called entangled a fantasy adventure novel time slip novel involving one character in the 
20th century, 21st century, one in the one 24,000 years ago. And then I've written two out of three of a series of novels about the Spanish conquest of Mexico. And that series is called War God. So while all this is going on, I become aware of new developments in the field that I covered in Fingerprints of the Gods right through to Underworld, major new developments. For example, in Fingerprints of the Gods, a, center, a centerpiece of the proposal there was that there was a humongous global cataclysm between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago. And I couldn't be sure exactly what that cataclysm was. I investigated yeah. a number of possibilities, most strongly the earth crust displacement theory of Charles Hapgood that was subsequently refined by Rand and Rose Flemath in their book, uh, when, the, when the Sky Fell. Earth crust displacement was a mechanism that interested me and that I focused on in Fingerprints of the Gods. Um, but I didn't really have a smoking gun. There were a lot of theories out there. Earth crust displacement was certainly not bought by mainstream geophysicists. They, they didn't see that theory as, as, as working at all. It was very controversial. Now, I haven't abandoned the earth crust displacement theory, but these days I'm interested in solid science, mm -hmm. uh, which, 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 which can be, um, used to back up arguments that the mainstream do not find, uh, normally find acceptable. Um, and there is now solid science on precisely a global cataclysm between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago. And that solid science is the work of a team of more than 30 uh, geophysicists, mainly um, marine uh, scientists, uh, impact dynamics, animal extinctions, people, archaeology, people from all different disciplines have come together uh, to analyze the compelling evidence that the Earth was hit by several fragments of a giant comet uh, 12,800 years ago and may have encountered further fragments of the same comet 11,600 years ago. And so we have an extinction level event precisely between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago, as I proposed in Fingerprints of the Gods. And this new science has not been put before the public in any major way. Mm -hmm. Up till now, apart from a few newspaper reports, it's been confined to the rarefied atmosphere of prestigious scientific journals like the Journal of Geology, like the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and, and by the way, the notion of a comet impact with the Earth is not mutually contradictory with the notion of Earth crust displacement. I published an article on my website in 2006 by Flavio Barbiero, which considers exactly that possibility that a displacement of the crust could be set off by a comet impact, uh, hitting, hitting the Earth with enough force at an oblique angle could destabilize the crust sufficiently to set it in motion. I'm not going into this in the new book. I'm concentrating on the new science, which cannot be refuted. Uh, and which therefore allows me to move on from that to consider the main proposition of my argument that in that cataclysm, now fully established by science between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago, we lost a whole episode of the human story. Uh, an, an advanced civilization that already knew how to make megalithic architecture to move huge blocks of stone that knew all about agriculture, uh, that, that was wiped out in this cataclysm, but that there were survivors and those survivors did pass on the memory and the knowledge of the lost civilization sure you mentioned 2006 and supernatural um one of my favorite books from you by the way graham and i want to come back to that um let's focus on some of the science um um, catastrophism uh, in a geology sense maybe bring in randall carlson i've watched presentations with randall carlson um, this man commands attention. He commands yeah. attention. He's a serious dude, Robert. <laughs> Randall, Randall commands attention because he has absolutely done the work. Yeah. Rand, Randall has spent the last quarter of a century. He's lived it. He's lived it. He's lived it. He's lived it. And um, he's not formally qualified as a geologist, mm. but his geological knowledge is immense. Mm. And it's the result. It's the result of quarter of a century of detailed field work. And, and uh, he brings he brings to this an inquiring mind and an openness of spirit, which makes his work very, very accessible. So I, while researching Magicians of the Gods, of course, I've been in contact with Randall for many years. Yeah. Uh, I proposed to him that he and I make a research trip together mm -hmm. uh, across the what are called the Channel Scablands uh, of the Pacific Northwest in the United States, uh, which are 
areas that lay immediately south of the ice cap during the last ice age. I mean, this is a, it's important uh, for your listeners to get a, a, sen- a picture of the world uh, 12,800 years ago. This was the ice age. North America, uh, roughly everywhere north of New York, was covered by an ice cap more than two miles deep. And then something happened that caused it to radically melt down. And it's only in the last seven years that we've really had the evidence as to what that was, that it was the impact of at least four fragments of a a fragmented comet, with those fragments being up to a mile in diameter of at least four fragments on the North American ice cap itself. Massive kinetic energy, massive amount of heat, temperatures in excess of 2,200 degrees centigrade, which is the boiling point of quartz, are unleashed. Epicenter is the North American ice cap, but the Outward effects of this cataclysm uh, have been established across more than 50 million square miles of the Earth's surface with mm. with what are with the characteristic signatures of a comet impact, the nano diamonds, the melt glass, the carbon spherules distributed across 50 million square miles. The epicenters in North America, there were impacts on the northern European ice cap and the furthest east that they've tracked the impacts are, are Syria. So this is an object that multiple objects that come in from the northwest on a trajectory over Canada, cross North America, cross the Atlantic, hit the North, northern European ice cap, and the final fragments rain down over, over Syria. And it's accompanied by massive sea level rises, uh, huge evidence of disturbance of animal populations, extinctions on a dramatic scale. This is truly an extinction level event, and it's right there in the basement of everything that we've been taught of is history, and it's not been taken account of by historians and archaeologists in building their model of the origins of civilization. I don't even blame them for this because it's so new. Mm -hmm. The evidence really has only been put out in the professional journals since 2007 and has not entered the public domain massively yet, and historians and archaeologists are going to have to scramble to catch up with it, because you cannot have a model of the origins of civilization saying that those origins began, you know, roughly 11,600 years ago and not take account of the extinction level cataclysm that immediately preceded that moment. The biggest thing to ever hit our planet at weather time. At any rate, the biggest thing to hit our planet since the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And an impact and a cataclysm that has been missed up to now because there weren't obvious craters. Mm. It's really important to be clear about this. Why weren't there obvious craters? Because the impacts 12,800 years ago hit mainly the North American ice cap, which was two miles deep, and the craters were in ice, Mm. which then melted away. Yes, in the last couple of years, the shock effects on the ground under the ice cap have begun to be mapped out, and we now have at least four sites of massive, massive impacts, but it's the impact proxies, it's the nano diamonds, it's the carbon spherules, it's the melt glass all around the world that absolutely prove this was a comet impact. And interestingly, it was those same impact proxies that were the initial evidence for the cosmic impact that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And initially, Lewis and Walter Alvarez, when they proposed that that was why the dinosaurs became extinct, on the basis of these impact proxies, were ignored and laughed at by their scientific colleagues. But eventually, they were proved to be right. And the same process has been unfolding over the last seven years in science over what we refer to as the Younger Dryas Comet, because it set in motion a mysterious climatic event called the Younger Dryas that lasted from 12,800 to 11,600 years ago and was accompanied by planet-wide extinctions of animal species and, I believe, the loss of an advanced civilization now only remembered in myth and tradition. Sure. I know you go into uh, Brett's quite a lot in the book. Um, so you call in Brett's, yes. Yeah. And, character. Yeah. And, and the thing, I know you say you don't blame, and, it, and it's very easy to pick up the blame game and say, look at these academics. These guys aren't, you know, doing their job. And you know what? They've got enough on their plate, Graham. They're not catastrophists. And, and, I agree. You know. And there's a, there's a bias against any theories that propose a role for cataclysms uh, in the story of life on Earth. It seems that we have an inbuilt resistance to this, even though we know that it's happened, uh, that a number of the 
major leaps forward in, in the evolution of species have occurred immediately after global cataclysms. There have been global cataclysms in the past, which, you know, which are recognized. The, the dinosaurs, the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, an extinction level event, massive cosmic impact, mm -hmm. actually had a huge effect on life on Earth. Uh, you and I would not be sitting here having this conversation if the dinosaurs had not been made extinct 65 million years ago. I don't know. Maybe there would have been some intelligent reptile on the planet, but mammals would not have found their place in the sun. Uh, the extinction of dinosaurs opened the way for mammals. So we can't deny that these impacts with objects that come winging in from, from outer space, comets and asteroids, we can't deny that these impacts have had a huge effect on life on Earth. And the most recent one, now established by science between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, also had a huge effect on the story of life on Earth and uh, particularly on the human story. I think what I like about Magicians of the Gods is, Glenn, that the, the detail of the book and the detail that you've gone into uh, with both the geological data and the cometary fragments and the science of cataclysm, it's, it's so detailed and it's so documented that hasn't been done uh, in, in the academic manner. It's bizarre that we have a journalist doing it, but that's the way the lie of the land is. And I'm quite accepting of that now, Graham. I have to accept that society is not a courageous one. We have academic people that, you know, they backbite and they bitch at each other on, you know, it's it's the nature of the human evolution in an educational sense. It is. It's the way things it's the way things work. It's sad. It's sad. It's sad, it's sad, but it has its upside as well. This is the downside of the highly specialized approach that is taken in our sciences. So a geologist in our scientific world is likely to work completely independently from an astronomer. Uh, and they may never compare notes, you know. Um, and and um, a historian might work in a completely different way from an anthropologist and they never and they never compare notes. So I think it takes individuals who are outside of that scientific structure, who aren't locked into one particular discipline, um, to synthesize information across a broad range of disciplines and say, well, actually, there's a picture emerging from this, which which is not being dealt with by the mainstream at all. And that's, you know, that's been my my role and the role of a number of others of us who are working in this field is to try to provide that broader picture. And most importantly, to try to provide an alternative story. It's not healthy that custody of our past, of the human past, mm. should be possessively held by one single group of people, historians and archaeologists, who claim to be such great experts in their field that we don't need to do any more work. They've established the whole story of our past, and there's, there's nothing more to be done except fill in the details. This is the mistake. They've prematurely closed their accounts with the past. There's much more to be done than just filling in the details, and that's why I've written Magicians of the Gods, and I hope it will have sufficient impact to shake things up a bit. I like the detail you go into too, Graham, with the the oral traditions of the indigenous wisdom of uh, with the relation to a comet. I just think this is a layer of a background that's necessary. It's really necessary, and it's quite astonishing when you get into it in precisely the areas that were most dramatically affected by the flooding caused by the comet impact. We have ancient myths and traditions mm -hmm. from Native American Indian peoples which speak of that disaster and describe a, a, a comet with a long, wide tail coming down to the earth and destroying all the big animals and creating floods and creating wildfires because that's also what you get. You get floods and you get wildfires because superheated ejector from the impact can be carried hundreds of miles, even thousands of miles away from the impact and fall on primordial forest and set it aflame. And it looks like a very large area of the Earth's surface was set, in, set on fire mm -hmm. uh, 12,800 years ago at the same moment that there was flooding. And interestingly, that, that notion of fire and flame uh, is also found in Plato's account of the submergence of Atlantis. We're just coming up to break, so uh, just for the webpage, you can go to CapricornRadio.com for the free archives and CapricornMembers.com for the HD TV and uh, MP3 archives. Uh, but for now, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a moment. There is something majestic in the land of Ireland. This is known the world over. 
The Celtic Irish are descendants of the Tuatha de Danann, a mysterious, supernatural race of gods written about in ancient Irish Gaelic texts. This is the basis for all Irish mythology and our megalithic ancestors are interlinked with these peoples. You have a chance to come and see these monuments and temples for yourself. The megalithic landscape is rich in the realms of myth, legend and wisdom. Come see all this on the most spectacular Sacred Sites tour in March 2016. The Sacred Sites and Equinox tour is not to be missed. Tour highlights include Grinnan of Aelok Observatory, the Giant's Ring Henge and Dolmen, St. Patrick's Day Special at St. Patrick's Ancient Chair, March 17th, Knockmany Passage Tomb linked to the Queen Maeve with special access, Beemore Temple Complex, Dunluce Castle, the Giant's Causeway, Beltany Stone Circle, Kilcluny Dolmen, and the Lock Crew Equinox Event Alignment. Of course, we will see the famous tombs of Newgrange, Noth and Doth, also Fornox Rock Art and Shamanic Chamber, Tara Hill Complex, and we're going to finish at the Tua de Danans origins in the northwest of Ireland at Carroll Keel, dated 3500 BC, and the famous Carroll Moor 5000 BC Complex. Check out all the full itinerary on the Tours Events page for more details at jameswagger.com. Welcome back to Capricorn Radio. This is your host James and don't forget to check out the archives uh, at capricornmembers.com. You can subscribe for membership, uh, doing a lifetime membership deal at the moment. And uh, of course, you can still check out the free archives at CapricornRadio.com. And then uh, HDTV uh, shows as well on the Capricorn members page. But for now... Wow. Uh, Graham, let's switch gears. I want to talk megaliths for a minute. Gebekli Tepe, let's go straight to it. What an absolutely jaw-dropping, stupendous sight. I mean... Great rewriting history, but still the architectural prowess, the artistic prowess there, and I think it's one of the best megalithic sites we've got on the planet. It's a fantastic megalithic site. I am so glad that I was able to see it and to explore it freely mm. before the present hideous wooden roof was placed <laughs> over it. Same as Malta. It, they did it in Malta as well. They did it in Malta as well. And again, I'm so glad that I was able to explore the Mog Maltese megalithic sites before they covered them with these structures. But at least in Malta, the roofs are relatively tasteful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here in uh, Gobekli Tepe, it's a hideous thing. Supposedly a temporary structure, a thick wooden roof weighed down with platforms loaded with stones to stop the roof blowing away. You can hardly see anything. I mean, if somebody had set out deliberately to remove the drama and the mystery from Gobekli Tepe. They couldn't have done more than the German Archaeological Institute have done by putting this roof in place. And that's a pity because the German Archaeological Institute has done some great work at this site. And this site is a heritage of the whole of humanity. It does need to be protected, but the way they're protecting it at the moment is ugly and uh, deeply out of character with the nature of the site. And I, I regret it enormously. Look, we're looking at first and first and foremost, it's important to be clear what the mainstream picture is that 12,000 800 years ago down to 11,600 years ago, say, our ancestors were simply hunter-gatherers. They were all over the world, basically what we would refer to as quote-unquote primitive hunter-gatherers. Their mental processes may not have been primitive, but they were living a, a, a life of wandering nomadic people, hunting and gathering for their for their sustenance and living in portable shelters. Um, and then round about 11,600 years ago, a bit mysteriously, in southeastern Turkey, there's a sudden spread of agricultural knowledge. Um, agriculture disseminates, species start to be domesticated, both agricultural, both, both, both crops and uh, wild animals start to be, start to be domesticated. 
Um, and, and that is regarded as the beginning of the Neolithic, what's called the Neolithic. And then after several thousand years of development, increasingly complex urban settlements like Chateau Hoyuk, you get the first megalithic architecture about five and a half thousand years ago mm -hmm. on Malta. This is the mainstream model. So it's very disturbing for that mainstream model to find at the very moment that agriculture starts to disseminate in southeastern Turkey, 11,600 years ago, to find a site, a sealed site, which was deliberately buried by whoever it was that made it, which is a truly megalithic site on a scale that's about 50 times bigger than Stonehenge, gigantic wow. scale, uh, with, the, with the world's, as far as we know, uh, first perfectly aligned north, south, east and west building, which tells us that, that whoever put it there had a knowledge of astronomy and was able to use it with the deployment of very large megaliths. Majority are around 20 tons, but there are some that are, are heavier than that, with huge organization and planning brought into work. All of this happens as though a group of... And here's the fantasy that mainstream archaeology is now trying to project to us so that they can preserve their model of the past that by some miraculous process, a group of hunter-gatherers woke up one morning and decided to create the most perfect and the largest megalithic site uh, that would ever exist on Earth 7,000 years before anybody else thought of the idea. Um, mm -hmm. That, that uh, Consider what that means. That means that they had acquired the ability to organize a labor force, to feed and water a labor force of at least several hundred, to plan out a site, to take astronomical observations. And all of that is without any background, because Gobekli Tepe just appears out of nowhere with no background before it. And that seems to me absurd. I to believe, suggest that. And I that, believe there's no water source nearby either, Graham. There's no water source nearby. You'd have to bring the water in for your labor force. It requires high level organization, which is not normally attributed to hunter-gatherer peoples, but to preserve their model, archaeologists are now sudden, are now happy to uh, give this uh, high-level, fully evolved organizational and stone-working ability uh, to a group of hunter-gatherers. I suggest what it looks much more like is a transfer of technology, that what we have at Gobekli Tepe are the survivors of a lost civilization who already knew everything that needed to be known about megalithic architecture and transferred that knowledge to the hunter-gatherer population they settled amongst and at the same time transferred to that population the essential knowledge that allowed agriculture to disseminate widely uh, at exactly that moment. This, to me, looks a lot more like is better and more easily explained with the notion of a group of people who already had this knowledge who came to Gobekli Tepe rather than the fantasy that uh, hunter gatherers were suddenly expired inspired to do this most incredible work with no previous experience. Hmm. Graeme, you know I've done the review for the book, but I also got the audio book as a little way of recapping without having to reread the book again. And I want to draw attention to that because you have narrated your own audio book. And what I find fascinating is you pick up the sentiment of the author. What better person to read a book than the book? <laughs> because a lot of people today, they don't do their own narr narration on their own book. But uh, I like because your book has wrote in a narrative as you journeyed around the world, researching this, living it as well. And that comes through in the book. I want to draw attention to that. Um, because when you're when you're talking to Klaus Schmidt, you you feel like you're there, Graham. You know, and and and, it's, and I'm just glad that you've done this. So I appreciate. It. I wanted to draw attention to that. Thank um, you. I enjoyed recording the book. It's the it's the first time I've done the audio of one of my own books. In fact, a lot of my books aren't in audio at all yet. But where mm -hmm. they have been, it's been an actor who's read them. Mm -hmm. um, this time, I was asked to read it myself, and I very much enjoyed the uh -huh. experience. It's 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 quite. It takes a long time. <laughs> uh, it, it actually yeah. took f five working days to full days to record the whole the whole text of the book. But I like I like reading it out loud because I know what bits I want to emphasize and what bits. I want to play, you know, to put in a lower tone. There's there's some things that need to be projected forward into the foreground in tone of voice, and some and some things that are are, are more workable in the background. And you can do that with tone of voice if you really know your story. So I I very much enjoyed reading this. And, and the reason I mention that is when you're with Klaus Schmidt and you're and you're talking about Gebekli Tepe, um, you really understand your mindset more so uh, because of the narrative. And for example, I mean. Uh, sad that Klaus is gone now. Um, but... Sad he passed away. He died in the summer of 2014, and I did my 
long interview. In fact, encounter, I spent three days with him at Gobekli Tepe, and he very kindly showed me around the site in the greatest possible detail. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, he, he died in the summer of 2014. And leaving a vacuum, I'm not sure who's going to, re who, who's, who's in the place to take over from him. The, 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 the German Archaeological Institute seems a bit disoriented at the moment as to what to do. And I don't see clear and definite plans for the future excavation at Gobekli Tepe unfolding. Hopefully it will, but at the moment it all looks a bit uncertain. And I think Klaus, he, he, he was hoping that there was some other stuff that's going to explain the evolution. And and, and, we're, and what you're saying is, Graham, this is like a devolution. They suddenly appear and then it doesn't make sense. stuff is the oldest. This was what puzzled Klaus Schmidt. I mean, how does one, you know, if one buys into a model where where ideas have to have a history and, and have to evolve, you have to see the background to the evolution of ideas, then how do we explain a site where which appears out of nowhere and where the very best work is the oldest work and where it then starts slowly over about a thousand years that the site was in use, it then starts slowly to devolve and so that the latest stuff is not nearly as good as the oldest stuff and then finally they bury the whole thing and nobody touches it for more than 10,000 years. Um, well, for Klaus Schmidt, who, who you know, f didn't like the idea of a lost civilization. He, he just didn't like the idea. He didn't, you know, I said to him, how does it feel to be, you know, the man who's the, the archaeologist who's discovered the temple that's rewriting history? And, and Klaus Schmidt kind of replied, well, mm, I prefer not to say that it's rewriting history, but adding a new chapter to history. In other words, he wants to cling on to the old model mm -hmm. uh, because, because he knows in the field of archaeology that if you uh, dispense with the old model, you're going to encounter the anger and fury of all those who are still bought into the old model. So it's much better to stick with the old model and try and refine it a bit. And mm -hmm. that's what he, so he was hoping that further excavations at Gobekli Tepe would reveal evidence of the slow and gradual evolution to the point where 9,600 BC, 11,600 years ago, they could make these full-scale megalithic structures. But actually what the latter excavations have shown is that that material, which he hoped to, sh to be more primitive, turns out to be even more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, that there, there seems to have been a moment when everything began at Gobekli Tepe, and it was at its best then. Another thing I like about the discovery of uh, Gobekli Tepe is it was necessary for alternative history as a movement. And I say that when, when you had shock uh, and the Sphinx theory, I mean, the, the Egyptologists turned around and kind of laughed really kind of arrogantly, you know, where's the pot shards of the civilization? And Gobekli Tepe is those pot shards. It's like, if Gobekli Tepe is there, if it's there, well, then it just it just levels the playing field. It changes everything, uh, and it requires us um, if we approach this from a reasonable frame of mind rather than from an ideological frame of mind, which is what unfortunately I believe archaeologists are doing. Mm -hmm. If we approach this discovery of Gobekli Tepe with a reasonable frame of mind, then it requires us to reevaluate every other megalithic site in the world. See, Gobekli Tepe is very special because whoever made it deliberately buried it when they were done with it. The site, as I say, ran for about a thousand years and then it was deliberately buried. Um, that's not the case with the megalithic temples of Malta. It's not the case with the T-shaped megaliths of Menorca, mm. for example, which look pretty much exactly like the Gobekli Tepe megaliths. Those Menorcan megaliths are thought to be just three or four thousand years old. But can we be sure of that? Because both in Menorca and in Malta, uh, the megalithic sites were fully exposed for thousands of years. They were trampled over by multiple other cultures. Uh, organic materials were introduced that were not contemporary with the date of the creation of the site. And yet it's only by carbon dating organic materials that we can arrive at a guess as to the age of the site. That works with Gobekli Tepe where the site has been completely sealed for more than 10,000 years, but it doesn't work with Malta and Menorca and other megalithic sites, and it doesn't work with the Sphinx, mm. to get to your point. Mm. As you rightly say, when John Anthony West and Robert Schock proposed a much older Sphinx back in 1992, uh, a Sphinx that had been subjected to at least a 1,000 years of heavy, heavy rainfall, causing characteristic erosion patterns, Egyptology wouldn't accept that idea at all. They said it's impossible. Uh, if there were a culture that was capable of creating the Sphinx 12,000 years ago, you'd have to go back about that far to get the rainfall. 
if, it, if there was a culture that was capable of creating the Sphinx, we would find other megalithic sites around the world that are about 12,000 years old as well, and we don't find any. But of course, they were saying that before the discovery of Gobekli Tepe. Now we have Gobekli Tepe. It is at least 11,600 years old, for sure. No doubt about that whatsoever. And if you can make Gobekli Tepe, then you can make the Sphinx. We are looking, I believe, at the fingerprints of a lost civilization. Sure. And just a side note, Graham, there is a T-shaped megalith off the north coast of Ireland too, not like Menorca or Gobekli Tepe, but they're a bit more primitive looking. But uh, there is a lot of, there's a lot of history there on that island too. Yeah. Um, um, let's stay on Turkey. Uh, I want to talk Darren Kuya. Uh, I think that's the pronunciation uh, on the underground yeah. cities. Yeah. As an engineer, Graham, I just find this Darren Kuya place screaming to begging to be explained. Graham. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's actually one of hundreds. Hundreds. The whole of Cappado the Cap Cappadocia region of, of Turkey is, is honeycomb with what are referred to as underground cities, gigantic structures that are cut out under the ground. And again, you know, how does how does one date these places? They're cut into solid stone. There is no technique for dating the cutting of stone, no reliable, universally accepted technique for that. Uh, thus, archaeologists have to rely on carbon dating. And you can't carbon date stone. You can only carbon date organic material that is associated with the stone. And that association needs to be really good. You need to be sure that... The organic material you're dating, you need to be sure that it was placed there at the same time that the stone you're interested in dating was placed. And if you can't be sure of that, you may get a falsely young date, mm -hmm. or for that matter, a falsely old date. Um, and and uh, this, this is why the whole thing is difficult with places like Dering Kuyu, which are entirely cut out of the living bedrock, and, and which we know have been occupied by more recent cultures. I mean, archaeologists' fairy tale about the underground cities of Turkey, uh, is that they go back maybe to the first millennium BC and are associated with the people called the Phrygians, that that's when they were created. But then it's accepted that many later cultures made use of them for various purposes, storage, sometimes for hiding in them when enemies were around and so on and so forth. Um, so it beats me how they can arrive at an accurate dating of these sites. And if you actually go into the literature in great depth, you find that they don't, that it is actually a story. Uh, based on limited organic material and huge assumptions being made about the contemporane contemporaneity of that organic material mm -hmm. and of the rock-hewn structure. It's possible that the so-called underground cities of Turkey date right back to the Younger Dryas, that they go all the way back to, to that episode between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago when the Earth was being bombarded by comet fragments we now know from the science, uh, when there was a, a global climate change on a cataclysmic scale, uh, and when it would have made sense for people to create underground shelters. Mm. Yeah, they, I think Darren Key, just on its own, as many, I think, Kai My Mackley or something like that, there's another one. A new, city, uh, a new one has just been discovered, which is like five or ten times bigger than Darren Kuyu. Wow. We have underground tunnels that run for seven or eight kilometers connecting different, uh, different, different these underground cities. I think uh, that's why I go into them in the book, because I think they are one of the great unsolved mysteries uh, of, the, of the past. And the easy assumption that they date back no further than the first millennium BC proves to be based on nothing. Uh, and we need to we need to consider them now in the new vision of history that is emerging as a result of our knowledge of the cataclysm between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. How many people are we talking could live in there, Graham? Well, this is, a, again, an interesting point. See, the argument is, the, the mainstream argument is that these were created originally to provide a place of shelter for villagers when they came under attack from invading forces. Now, I can only say to you, psychologically, if I'm a villager and I wish to hide from invading forces, then the last thing I'm going to do is take my whole family and the whole population of the village underground and shut them in uh, behind, a, behind a, a, a rolling door, uh, because that can easily be discovered by the enemy. And then all they need to do is block that door, and I and my entire village are going to starve to death. It doesn't seem uh, a very effective way. Uh, to guard against the threat of invaders. But it is a very effective way to guard against uh, impacts from the sky, to guard against fragments of uh, fiery fragments of, of comet 
tearing down through the Earth's atmosphere and, and spreading wide-scale destruction. And we know that fragments of the comet did land as far east as Syria and that therefore Turkey was affected. I know just from looking at the engineering aspects of what they achieved with the underground cities in Cappadocia is that the vertical shafts running down, Graham, are so precise and so least, well laid out. Yeah, those are the vent ventilation shafts. I mean, the engineering of those of those underground structures is, the, let's call them hypogea. You know, these are hypogea. And, and the, the engineering is stunning. And they're thinking about ventilating this place very, very carefully. So you can be down 150 feet underground and you can feel the fresh air blowing in wow. you know this is very very carefully thought out for the long-term stay as to how many people who could stay in them well that that a lot depends on access to food supplies um in in terms of of sheer uh, physical space uh, i think uh, daring kuyu might be capable of holding a couple of thousand people let's hypothesize for a second graham you're not going to build this place when the comet strikes. If the comet comes in, could they have had knowledge of the comet coming in? A fragment come in and then they decide to build this place. Well, so my point is that this was a sustained episode. Um, this, the, the major impacts were 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. Yeah. Um, but this whole period was a cataclysmic period. It began 12,800 years ago. I don't think that was the end of the lost civilization. I think the final end of the lost civilization came later, 11,600 years ago in the second series of impacts. But there were likely smaller impacts throughout this period. Uh, the notion of, of, a, of a rain of fire and deadly danger from the sky would have been widely distributed. It explains why, to this day, almost every culture in the world has a deep-seated ancient fear of comets. Comets are fearsome things. If you go into the mythology, they are regarded as, as earth destroyers. They are regarded as terrible omens of doom and destruction. And why should that be for what is just a pretty light in the sky, unless that pretty light in the sky uh, turns into an object approaching the earth at 70,000 miles an hour, uh, packing more kinetic energy than the entire nuclear arsenal of the world? Sure. Uh, Graham... Uh, I'm going to be at the Origins Conference. I've got to mention that on behalf of Andrew Collins and Hugh Newman's putting on the Origins Conference. Danny Hillman's going to be speaking at that about Gunang Padang. I'm really excited to see that. Um, tell us about Gunang Padang. You've been there. What, what's your set? I'm actually coming at you not far from the Giants Causeway. So, and I'm right. glad to see you getting a mention in the book about the Giants yeah, Causeway. You mention the Giants Causeway. Well, look, um, my, my project in this book has been to assemble all the new evidence that has a bearing on the lost civilization proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, that has accumulated in the last 20 years. And just as Gobekli Tepe is an incredibly, incredible, relatively newly discovered archaeological site, the excavations didn't begin until the second half of the 1990s, and they're still underway. We have another site on the other side of the world, in Indonesia, on the mm -hmm. island of Java, uh, where um, Indonesia's chief experts, expert, geological expert in megathrust earthquakes, and that is Danny Hillman Natuwijaja, uh, PhD, uh, a, a globally renowned geologist paid attention to what was thought to be a natural hill with about a 2,500 year old megalithic site on top of it. He put down core drills. He did remote sensing with ground penetrating radar with seismic tomography. And what he's discovered is that natural hill is a man-made pyramid more than 300 feet high. Uh, and on top of it is a relatively recent megalithic site. But when you go down, when you drill down, you find the evidence of massive construction going back more than 20,000 years into the past. Again, a discovery that cannot be explained by the present model of history. So I, uh, I indeed am very excited by Gunung Padang, and it occupies a prominent and important role uh, in Magicians of the Gods. And we shall see what unfolds there in the years to come. Uh, what interests me is that now anywhere in the world where we have a site that has been uncontaminated and untouched by later cultures. Mm -hmm. um, we find datings that go back to much older times. Just recently in the Sicily Channel, uh, at a depth of uh, more than 120 feet underwater, uh, mm -hmm. a, giant, a giant megalithic site has been, has been found, including a, a 12 meter long uh, monolith broken into to two parts. Uh, and this site we know has been covered by the sea for well over 9,300 years. Uh, we don't know how long it stood there before that, but we can say it's at least 9,300 years old. And a giant megalithic site that's 9,300 years old 
makes sense in terms of what we now know from Gobekli Tepe, but cannot be explained by the previous model of history, which is the model that's still being taught to us in schools and universities. Yeah, I'm looking at the pictures on your blog here, Graham. The, it's absolutely stupendous, this monolith. Uh, absolutely mind-blowing. There seems to be a hole carved in it as well. The a hole um, all the way through it, um, and it's intriguing. I would suggest that it goes back. It was probably standing on that site for 1,500 years at least wow. before... Uh, the sea level rose and, and, and covered it. So this is, again, interesting, you know, just as at Gobekli Tepe, we can be certain that there was no intrusion of a later culture bringing in falsely young dates. We can be certain with this submerged site as well of its age. And what's emerging is a new picture of the past that we have to get to grips with. The information is coming in fast these days, Graham, isn't it? It's coming in fast. Absolutely. This is a, the, the, there's an exponential growth in this, in this information. It's coming in from all around the world. It's like, you know, we just haven't been looking in the right way and in the right places. But when we do look in the right way in the right places, if we're open, if we have a closed mindset that says it's impossible that there was any human civilization more than 12,000 years ago, if that's our closed mindset, then that's what we're going to find in the past. But if we're a bit more open than that and prepared to allow the past to speak to us directly, then an entirely different story begins to emerge. And it's a fascinating story. And I suggest it's a story we need to know. Uh, if we have a false knowledge of our past, then our, our, our ability to handle the predicament of our present is diminished. We need to know our own story. Graham, uh, perhaps a bit of a reach here. I mentioned Gunang Padang and the basalt columns like the Giant's Causeway. I, yeah, that's a good, a good point, which I need to make. The megalithic site on top of Gunung Padang, the one that is thought to be relatively recent, about 2,500 years old, is made with columnar basalt. And mm -hmm. columnar basalt, it does form naturally into blocky uh, segments like the Giant's Causeway. The Giant's Causeway is made of columnar basalt. Now, what you'll observe at the dry, Giant's Causeway is that the columnar basalt is all stacked vertically. Mm -hmm. The moment that you get that pattern changing and you get the columnar gas basalt arranged horizontally, you know mm -hmm. that human beings have been involved. Okay. Uh, that they are working with a, with a natural material which forms into, into blocky, regular shapes. Like railway sleepers. They're using it as a construction material. They didn't do that at the Giant's Causeway. It's a totally natural site. They did do that at Gunung Padang. Columnar basalt was used as a construction material. A bit of a reach. Is there any link like that type of style of architecture with Nan Madol? Is that not bad? Huge, huge link. And I, I, I covered Nan Madol uh, very extensively in, in my earlier books, particularly mm. in, in Heaven's Mirror and in Underworld. Mm. Um, Nan Madol is a site that is constructed entirely of columnar basalt. Um, no, no question that human beings were, were involved in the, their buildings there. And, and this is thought to be, well, maybe a thousand years old at the most. And again, what's that based on? It's based on organic material, which might have been introduced by later cultures. Mm -hmm. I became interested in this because I then did quite extensive scuba diving offshore of Nan Madol, uh, where the, the sea drops away very rapidly uh, to a depth of about 130 feet. Uh, and down there at 130 feet, Standing up off the seabed are intact columns and other columns lying on their sides on the seabed, which greatly resemble the megalithic columns that are found on the island of Tinian a bit further west. Mm -hmm. And this is intriguing because, because we know, because of the depth of coverage, that those, that, that, that 130 foot layer off, off Nan Madol yeah. uh, is way back, way ancient, m more than 10,000 years old. Uh, and that suggests wow. that the, the similar megaliths on the island of Tinian may be just as old as that. So it's intriguing to me to find in Java, in Indonesia, yeah. a megalithic site that's built using the same structural elements and has many things in common. Uh, I, I think we're, we are, again, looking at the fingerprints of a lost civilization. Yeah. I was just just, that's, that's the, uh, the, the dating of, of um, uh, Nan Madol uh, has been wrong. I think yeah. we're much more ancient site. That's one burning question I've had for you because I know you're probably one of the handful of people in the world that goes to such a remote place like Nan Madal. It's in the middle of nowhere. And, 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 and dive, dive them extensively. I, I mean, we spent weeks diving that site. It's really quite an incredible place, quite scary. The visibility down at the bottom is sometimes very bad. And, mm -hmm. You know, there's all sorts of local traditions. <laughs> there's an intriguing local tradition at Nan Madal uh, about an underwater city. Uh, 
exactly off where the above water structures are about an underwater city and how it's guarded by two giant sharks. So one has this in mind when scuba diving on what are definitely the remains of a submerged city. There's so much material to get through, Graham. I, I got to get off the megalith for a second. Um, I mentioned Supernatural, one of my favorite books, Graham. And I tell you why. When I opened up the chart on Antarctic phenomena, I didn't see Antarctic phenomena. I seen rock art at Newgrange and Notes. Yeah. All around the perimeter. And I and I seen it as shamanic art, if you want to call it that. And you look at Gavrinis or Gavrini, I think they call it in French. Uh, on uh, Again, we see what looks like acoustic waves or shamanic art. Yes. Is it right to call these megalithic people shamans or? Is, well, is that... it's 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 um it's taking a bit of a cultural liberty. The word the word, but but it's a liberty I think we can take with with certain precautions. So, first of all, the word shaman is is culture specific. Mm -hmm. It actually comes originally from the Tungus Mongol, uh, and it's their word saman, which means one who sees or or one who sees far. Mm -hmm. um, what was what happened was that ethnologists in the 19th century, early 20th century, travelled amongst the Tungus Mongol and discovered these ritual functionaries there who were called shamans. And then others of their colleagues working in other parts of the world found pretty much the identical ritual functionary mm -hmm. performing the same function, entering trance states and deriving information from those trance states that could be used for healing or to identify where a herd of, uh, of game animals might be found and so on and so forth. Um, the, 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 the same ritual function was fulfilled in many different societies there. They weren't called shamans because that's a Tungus Mongol word, but they were performing the same functions as the shamans of the Tungus Mongol in the same way, using altered states of consciousness to acquire what is regarded as useful knowledge. So the Tungus Mongol word began to be spread out to all cultures that had this ritual function. Um, this ritual function is marked by a very specific kind of art, which is universal all around the world, that in the visionary state, the shaman uh, has experiences which he or she then later depicts as paintings. If they're gifted as painters, they recall their visions and they paint them. Um, and this is why we find the same patterns and the same entities appearing all around the world uh, because this is the classic art of shamanism and when we find the identical art from 30 or 40,000 years ago in the painted caves of exactly. Europe or for example in Indonesia where painted caves 40,000 years old have also been found lo and behold the same patterns and the same entities often you will see a creature that's part animal part human in form the same entities appear it's eerily similar mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 mm -hmm. in every case. And, and the, the suggestion that I look into in my book, Supernatural, is it's eerily similar because we are dealing with a freestanding parallel realm that only becomes accessible to our senses when we are in a deeply altered state of consciousness, a trance state, the characteristic state of shamanism, in other words. I mentioned that, Graham, because I, I think you know, with the megalithic civilization, or culture, I should say, of Western Europe, uh, look at the hypogeum, an acoustically tuned monument, and we have what I would say shamanic art or what entoptic phenomena as artwork. Um, such a high percentage of it. It's clear with entoptic phenomena. I, I, I actually don't like that phrase, although I use it myself because it's the phrase that's current in in. Mm -hmm. um, in science, uh, yeah. but, but it, it in, involves a value judgment. It says that somewhere that somewhere these images are are in the optic nerve mm -hmm. somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, and that's not necessarily the case. It's not um, all we know is that people, uh, human volunteers, put into deeply altered states of consciousness as a part of scientific investigation. Uh, report seeing these patterns, and mm -hmm. they they do so so universally that it's been possible to uh, catalog them. And, and arrive at a group of patterns that everybody everywhere in the world sees in trance states. And then secondly, those exact same patterns turn up on the walls of the painted caves uh, 40,000 years ago. So, you know, we can't go back and actually interview those <laughs> artists from 40,000 years ago, but we can make logical deductions yeah. from the character of their art yeah. that we yeah. are dealing with, with individuals who, for want of a better word, we would call shamans today and whose essential work is done using the deeply altered state of consciousness that is characteristic of shamanism, which is often entered using psychedelic plants or fungi, uh, but which can be entered by other techniques as well. For example, fasting or dancing around a hot fire for many, many hours, rhythmic drumming. All of these will, will uh, 
uh, affect the what I call the receiver wavelength of the brain mm. uh, and allow us to tune in to other realities. Of course, the mainstream says those other realities don't exist, that it's just our brain on drugs. Mm. But I've tried to show in Supernatural that it's much more complicated than that. And actually, we don't understand consciousness. The mystery of human consciousness is not resolved yet. And perhaps psychedelics are an incredibly effective tool for investigating the mystery of consciousness. We should not demonize them. We should consider their potential and, and make use of it. Sure. Uh, Graham, uh, two places I want to talk about, uh, Easter Ireland and Kotimbo, I think it is. Uh, there's somewhat parallels between there and Gebekli Tepe. Not only Easter Island, Kotimbo is in Peru, quite close to Lake Titicaca. Um, of course, Easter Island's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, two miles from, 2,000 miles from the coast of per Peru. Yeah. Um, but uh, there is certain icons, certain iconography. Mm -hmm. The figure with um, arms crooked at the elbows, the fingers on the, on the long belly. fingers placed across the belly. Well, that's found uh, on the T-shaped megaliths of Gobekli Tepe, which are humanoid. They do have arms and hands, uh, and the exact same posture, including a mysterious belt. Uh, is found on the figures of Easter Island. Uh, and, and the dating of the Easter Island figures is highly suspect, as I, as I argue in the book. We may be, we may be looking at, at figures that are well over 10,000 years old, not seven or 800 years old, as the mainstream claims. Then secondly, um, there are other icons. For example, the, 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 the icon that we would recognize as the letter H in our alphabet, the H shape. That shape, uh, that pattern turns up at Gobekli Tepe and it turns up at Tiwanaku in the highlands of the Andes. Many of the animals that we find at Gobekli Tepe are depicted almost identically mm. at Kutimbo uh, in, in Peru. And I'm, I'm suggesting this is not an accident, that, that all of these sites need to be reconsidered. This shared iconography needs to be reconsidered, both in terms of the age of the site and also the distribution of knowledge in the ancient world. I'm moving fast through the last few points, Graham, because I know we're running out of time. Coming up to the top of the hour, I want to mention the Akalus and the idea of sages carrying this wisdom. It's, yeah, important. it's an important part of the book, Graham. It's a very important part of the book. Um, and, um, and, and it refers, the Apkalu uh, are the civilizers of Mesopotamian myth and tradition, that mm -hmm. they come in a, in a time of darkness when humanity is living in an animalistic form and mm -hmm. teach the teach the benefits of civilization to our ancestors. And they are headed by a figure called Oannes, Uanadapa in the Sumerian language, who is um, their leader, but there are seven sages. There's a specific reference to seven sages. We get a reference to seven sages in Easter Island. We get a reference to seven sages uh, in Egypt, uh, in the Edfu building text, we get a reference to seven sages in India in the Vedas. Again, I think we're looking at a universal memory of the survivors of the lost civilization who traveled around the world seeking to bring back again the civilization that they had lost, but did not quite succeed, but left their fingerprints. Sure. I just want to mention there's some controversial evidence in there too. I know the Australian glyphs are in there, um, and Mohammed Ibrahim, who I've met as well, a uh, lovely guy. He's done some interesting stuff there too. Maybe just pass some comment on that. Well, I, I, I report the, the story of the Gospel of Glyphs yeah. uh, in Magicians of the Gods. I don't make a big deal out of it. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's intriguing for me. I, I, I think that that is, a, uh, that is a mystery that requires further investigation. I can't say absolutely that those are genuine. Uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs mm -hmm. from 3,000 years ago. But they, there's a possibility that they are, and it needs to be looked into much, much further. They do appear to tell a coherent story. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we should be open to this, particularly since artifacts that look like ancient Egyptian artifacts have also been found on the island of Java. Um, I, I don't think we should be close to the possibility that the ancient Egyptians were capable of extensive feats of navigation. In fact, I'm sure they were. Uh, and the question is how this then connects to the deep background of ancient Egypt and the notions of the origins of civilization in ancient Egypt, which indeed goes back to an island that was submerged in cataclysmic floods mm -hmm. uh, and earthquakes and fires all around the world. Wow. Um, last place, Graeme, tell me your take on Baalbek. Um, Baalbek is just one of the most extraordinary sites of the ancient world. I was privileged to do a research visit there in 2014. It is a magical place. 
uh, we have a giant U-shaped megalithic wall which surrounds but does not touch a Roman temple complex. Mm. The megalithic wall, I'm convinced, is vastly older than the Roman temple complex. Uh, it includes blocks of stone that weigh 900 tons each, and there are further blocks in the quarry, which I don't think the Romans even knew about, and I explained mm. why in Magicians of the Gods, which weigh up to 1,460 tons. In fact, the most recent of these blocks, the 1,400-ton-plus block, was only discovered by archaeologists last year in 2014, although they've been excavating the site for a century. Um, so, you know, this shows us that the mysteries of Baalbek are just beginning to show us their faces. Wow. Well, Graham, we're just about out of time. Uh, of course, GrahamHancock.com for the web page. You can gra catch Graham's talking events there on the blog. I'm going to see you at the Alternatives. My London sister, Kindred Spirit, Jerry, bought me a ticket, so I'm going to make the effort to come. That's, and... on, uh, that's on the 15th of October. 15th and... of October. So I'll see you there for that, Graham. I'll also see you at the Origins Conference. Looking okay. forward to that. Graham, loving the website, uh, you know, GrahamHancock.com. There's so much material on the site, Graham. Um, it, it's just it's, fascinating. It, it's been a work of um, 15, let's see, 1990, uh, 1980. Let's see, we started in 1999, 2009, 2015, 17 years that site's been running. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's found its place on the, on the internet. It really has. I know so many people go there, other radio hosts, other researchers. It, it's a place to go for people to meet and hang out and see knowledge. And, and, you know, we don't need to go to mainstream anymore. We have stuff well, on the internet. The great thing about the world that we live in today, we are not dependent on the big media anymore. We can talk to each other face to face. We have the magic of the internet. And with goodwill, it can be used for, for very good purposes. Sure. Graham, you're an inspiration to many people, and me included. Uh, you know, great to talk to you again. Great to see you. Um, I'll talk to you in the not-too-distant future, man. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you really soon. Keep well.